In this episode, we're going to look at the Pioneer A50 uh, Mini. I almost said micro component, but it's actually a mini component. Uh, high power amplifier. Part of their component setup that I've got. i got the four pieces here. I've already looked at the tuner. Now we're going to work on the amplifier. Tape deck and turntable will follow. But this amplifier, it had a few major problems. And, uh, well, it's going to be quite a challenge to get this one going. Let's check this out. Now this amplifier features soft touch volume control up and down soft touch inputs for the or switches for the inputs you can have a source microphone on here it is remote controllable from uh i think through the tuner pretty sure it's remote controllable what's it got on the back here it does have auto function so it is controllable from other components again uh, you can set the voltage on here And it'll operate 110 through 240 volts. Has a power consumption of 95 watts maximum. And it's also made in Japan. It's got three convenience outlets on the back of it. Okay, let's uh, turn the unit on. I've got it set for tuner. And we'll see if we get any volume. Hmm, don't hear anything. Speed fast. Speed slow. In here we have tone controls for low boost, high boost, high low boost, and high cut. But I don't hear any sound. So another unit that I have to uh, see what the problem is. As you can see, the audio is playing in from the media player here. So I've got signal going in. I have no signal coming out. And the unit right now is drawing how much power? 13 watts is what it's drawing on my power consumption meter. So top comes off this one. We'll see why it's not putting out any sound. So here's a quick look down the top of the unit. As you can see, it's got a couple boards. It looks like this one's the preamp board here, and the power amp board is below. And looking at this, hmm, what's this? This looks like it might be some type of a electromechanical control for the volume. Something that turns. I was just going to try and demonstrate what this does. Um, and then I found that uh, my camera wasn't recording and uh, it said my uh, image database was full at uh, 3,998 files. It would not record anymore in HD. If I switched to 4K, it would record. My memory card was not full because I delete the files as I use them. Uh, there was only uh, maybe 10 files on the card and it wouldn't record. And uh, anyway, I ended up having to remove the files off the memory card and format the memory card before I could continue because for some reason the database was not working. Uh, what this does, this is the motor that turns up the volume control and you'll see what it does here. It just provides a mechanical indication of the volume as that turns. So if I turn up the volume manually here by turning up the control, I expect that I will have sound, but I don't. Still no sound from this unit, although I can select my inputs, but there's no sound. First we'll check and see if there's any voltages on the output transistors. 43 volts, minus 43, minus 43, 43, and there's no DC. There's our bias voltages there. So that is looking okay. There's our base bias minus 0.5 and plus 0.6. So we have our bias for the transistors. That part's working. Now we have to look and see if there's a problem in the preamp, but the power amp itself seems to have power. 
this unit actually has multiple problems on here so um it actually took a long time i was working on this thing for for many hours before i got it going because there's more than one fault and uh, because there's compound faults on this thing i didn't even know which way i was where i was going and i had to start chasing signals down and uh well, you'll see. It gets interesting, but we got it in the end. So it looks like we're getting some power up to the preamp board. And the input selector is working. The volume control is not doing anything. I'm going to pull the board and look on this board, look on the other side. I want to take a look on the bottom side of it. So I have to remove a couple screws from the back here, and then I can remove this screw up here. And this should lift out to the point where I can see underneath it. So we basically have two faults on this thing. One, the speaker relay is not kicking in for the amplifier, and the other one is the volume control is not changing the volume up and down. So, um, yeah, that's where it got interesting here, because uh, had it only had one fault, it probably would have been a little, little easier troubleshoot this but I was kind of working blind on this thing now if we look down and hit side here we'll see this one's got a motor that controls the volume control it turns it mechanically and it's not trying to turn it so we know that there's probably a voltage that's missing from here there's a voltage regulator right down in here on the main board and there's also a relay in here for the speakers so we're not hearing that click so it's not not going into full uh, operational mode because the relay is not kicking in and it's got that ugly ugly glue that goes corrosive and conductive in here as well so we have a few things to contend with just gonna take a look at that regulator which is right down here on the board somewhere let's take a look at the, the connections on it this is it here let me take a close look at this regulator Hmm. Negative supply. I'm just going to resolder these regulators to start with because they don't look to have great connections. I can see some cracks around some of the big pins here so I'm just going to do a few of them just as a precaution this is one of those times where having a schematic diagram makes things a lot easier because you can see exactly what's connected to what and troubleshoot that way tracing your voltages from one stage to the next I don't have that luxury on this as in a lot of things I'm working on I don't have a schematic so I basically have to visually trace the copper traces in my mind and see what's going to where so sometimes when i'm waving the probe around that's what i'm doing is i'm i'm following the path to see what the next point of connection is i was looking at voltages that are heading to the other board i've got a plus 24 minus 13 a zero and a plus 13 24 volt or 25 volt regulator. Yeah, that's a 24 volt regulator there. This is the minus 13 volt regulator. That I can see. Where's the negative 24? Or where's the Here's something I've just noticed that's interesting. I'm getting a bit of an offset voltage when I look at the... I'm just going to clip onto the negative terminal of the motor here just so I can get an accurate read. Because I'm seeing voltage when I press the volume up button. I'm seeing voltage come up on the motor, but the motor obviously isn't doing anything. I just want to look at, across the motor itself. Let's 
See this? I'm getting voltage across the motor. And if I go to the fast setting, I'm getting minus 5 and plus 5. And the slow setting, I'm getting plus, minus 3 and plus 3. So that should be turning this motor, which should be turning the volume control. But it's not doing it. Hmm. Weird. I'm getting voltage to the motor, but the motor's not turning. Okay, that's a clue. The volume control motor is bad. Okay, I, I seem to be getting closer. We're in protection on this unit. It's in speaker protection mode. If I look at the uh, output here going to the relay, you will see I have sound for left and right. Now, I can't turn it up and down with the volume control because it's not doing anything. But um, when I adjust the control manually, I can increase that volume. So if I go to the other side over here and I turn the control up by hand, which way is that? There, that should give me some pretty good volume. Now I go back and look at the scope here. You see, I got lots of signal. So the amplifier is working. The input selector and everything's working. The volume control is not adjusting. That uh, could be just a jammed control or a burned out motor for that. But we have no sound because the relay is not being energized. And that's likely because this unit is in protection for some reason. Here's our relay power. There's nothing. No, no power on the relay. If I look between ground and the relay terminals, I got 41 volts. Now one side is fed from the power supply. The other side goes down to the transistor that switches the relay on and off. So 41 volts there. The relay is in protection for unknown reasons at this point. I was looking at my bias and my output. I have no I have no DC voltage being detected on the speaker terminals. Right? The reason the relay is there is to cut out any potential DC voltage if you were to have an output transistor that failed. And there's no DC voltage but it's not energizing the relay. So now I have to look into that circuit and see why it's not energizing the relay. We know the relay is not at fault because there's no power across the coil. I believe this is the drive transistor here for the relay. Base, probably emitter collector base, I think is the basing. Let's just take a look with the meter here. If this is the base, we should have a beep here, which we do, 0.6 volt drop. And that one's a 0.6 volt drop, so that's good. And this goes, there's a diode here. And there's our, there's our diode junction, so that diode is okay. And There's a capacitor here. There's a couple of resistors in this circuit down in here. It provides a time, a charge up time to turn this thing on. Um, this is a this is a capacitor here, I think. That's what I'm looking at. Yeah, there's a capacitor there, negative terminal, positive terminal. This should charge up when the power is turned on. This should charge up to turn on the uh, relay. I'm just going to connect the meter up here, hook up my ground to the chassis. I just want to monitor what happens here when this thing charges up. Okay, so this is this this capacitor should charge. Get my shot of my meter here. This capacitor should charge when I turn on the power. And it is. 
and then it's got three point six volts. It should be enough to pull this transistor into connection, but it's not. Now there's a Zener diode in here too. This capacitor connects to the Zener. It might not be charging to enough voltage. That's not the 41 volt supply. There's a, that's probably a resistor. I wonder if this resistor has gone open. Or changed value. What is it here? Let's just make sure the thing's discharged. Okay, the voltage is discharged. What is that? That's probably a little resistor. Is it? It's a small resistor. Hmm. I wonder if that resistor has gone bad. There's another diode here beside it too, looking at the top. Uh, that's a resistor and that should be a diode across there. Let's just see if that's gone bad. That's looking okay. Resistor wise. Mm, two megs. Oh, what size is? Let's just take a peek at that and see what size it's supposed to be. This is the resistor I'm talking about right down here. That little one there. And my meter showed two megs when I measured it in circuit. I'm just going to disconnect it. We'll take a look at it out of the circuit and see whether it's uh, gone open. I can hear it now. Get yourself a damn desoldering tool. I can do fine. Solder wick, thank you very much. But if someone else there wants to uh, donate a desoldering station to me, well, I'll certainly accept it. But go, going out and buying one, hmm, I think I can find better things to spend money on. Okay, let's pop that resistor out and take a look at it. Measure it out of circuit. Uh, 56k, right? 55, yeah, it's, it's, that one's okay. So that's not uh, where the problem is. There are a couple more transistors up here um, that are used to pull the protection down. It detects. They're feeding off of the output here. They're detecting the voltage here. And there's one here, and there's probably one that runs all the way around to the other side. These are the voltage detection lines. So I can see where it goes. It goes up to the top here. What's in the corner? Uh, there's a capacitor up in the corner there, too. I wonder if this is where it's being pulled down. Uh, let me just check these transistors out. Okay, and base. To collector looks okay. And emitter. Mm. There's two transistors here that appear to be in parallel. Are they are they separate or are they two? No, they're two. There are two transistors in parallel. It's uh weird. But when I measure emitter to collector, I'm getting like this is short. I'm just gonna disconnect this one pin here and see whether my relay will come out of protection. This is the feed from these these two transistors. So I'm just going to unsolder this pin and see whether it'll unmute the amp. Okay. Now if I monitor the charge voltage to the protection relay drive transistor we should see the charge voltage rise so this is the this is that resistor here that I just checked and it was okay that provides power to this 
Zener diode, which of course also went down to this resistor that I just unsoldered that goes back up to this circuit that will ground it out. I just want to see whether the voltage will rise above 3 volts. Yep. It does. <laughs> Okay, so now we know why this thing's being held down. This protection circuit is triggering, but is it the transistor that's bad, or is it? Uh, oh, I just monitor it here. 0.3 volts. See, it shouldn't be. If I reconnect that, it, it shuts the sound off. Now it has to charge up again. Right. I think one of these transistors might be leaky. Emitter to collector. There's two of them in parallel, so I'm going to just disconnect them. At least like now we know the amplifier works. It's just in protection, but why it's in protection is a good question because there is no there is no DC voltage on any of the outputs. I've checked that, and there's no there's no reason that this thing's in protection, other than the protection mode has failed. Okay, I've unsoldered both of these transistors. As I say, they're in parallel. The two bases are in parallel, the two collectors are in parallel, and the two um, emitters are in parallel. Let me lower the camera so you guys can see what I'm talking about. So this is the circuit here. Right, I've unsoldered... I think it's the emitters. I've unsoldered the two emitters. Let's uh, take a look at the readings of the meter. I know someone's probably going to ask me, Oh, I see you're using your Fluke 12. Why don't you use one of your new meters? Well, I could, you know, um, that latest meter I got is lines up with the fluke exactly for as far as um, as far as accuracy goes. The only thing I prefer about the fluke is in diode test mode, it's got the short, whereas the other one I have to look at it, and it, that's the only reason. Um, the other one I find is every bit as accurate. I use it for certain things, the same as I use the. Uh, that other one, the doctor meter, I use it for certain things too, like high current measurement, because it'll measure up to 20 amps. But uh, just for general purpose stuff, I'm used to this one, I trust it, and I just use it for that reason. Okay, let's measure emitter to collector. Now remember, emitter to collector should be open. I should say emitter to base. I think that's a bitter to base. No, that's a that's a bitter to base. Yes. So here's collector to base for both of them. Oops. And emitter to base. Emitter to collector. Hmm. Here's one emitter to collector. That one's okay. Here's the other one emitter to collector. Hmm. One of those transistors does appear to be leaky. So I found something interesting when I pulled the transistor to check it. There's also a resistor in here. I checked the 4.7K resistor and the capacitor but when I pulled the transistor these actually these two transistors are actually back to back in other words it's emitter base collector for one and then it's it's uh, base collector emitter so they're not in parallel but they're reversed and, and the reason that they've done that is so that they'll form a latching circuit so that once it once one trips the other one will latch so that it doesn't it doesn't turn the the uh, sound back on but I found when I pulled this out that there was some crud on the board itself, like almost like that circuit glue crap that was on the pins. So I just scraped it off and we'll check and see what happens now. Everything's connected. Our voltage is rising. And we have sound. And as you can see, I still don't have any volume control, which is a problem. But as you can see, Nothing's disconnected. 
this is the circuit here that I had pulled the transistors out here and everything is reconnected and now everything is working so we got the we got the sound working now we just have to deal with the the motor not turning the volume control and I'm sorry I banged the camera there that's what that's what happens when your camera's mounted on a pendulum you just have to nudge it and the whole thing will start to shake because my of course my camera it's mounted on a jib arm a makeshift jib arm that's actually served me quite well over the last year it lets me get camera angles that I would not normally be able to get so now we need to tackle the other problem and that problem is the motor because as I showed before when I hook up my meter to here I've got a voltage swing when I press the up and the down button but the motor is not turning I guess I'll have to remove the volume control to actually uh, be able to see that now I notice that this cabinet looks like it's been dropped because look at the plastic here is broken right these pieces are broken on this cabinet so uh, this I think this may have been dropped or something at some point because the plastic I just noticed is broken but I'm gonna pull the front panel off of this thing so that I can get at the uh, at the volume I have to I have to actually unscrew it from the front it appears to be attached to the front panel now how do I get into this I think I gotta take this thing out here because everything appears to be attached via that so I'm gonna have to remove these boards wonderful designs these things are you know they don't put screws into hold the board and they just put these plastic pins in you kind of got to squeeze them together to get the uh, get the board through I'll tell you these things caused many a broken board over the years for people trying to get the boards out and not squeezing the pins enough and you pry it a little too hard and you break it right at the uh, right at the hole here I don't like them I think I got everything out here they should lift off now I think okay what else is holding this this is one last clip. There we go. I can lift the board out of the way. As you can see, there's screws here that have to come out in order to lift that volume control assembly out. We'll just push that out of the way for now. So this is the volume control with its motor drive. Looks to be all one uh, piece, doesn't it? But you see, even if I apply power and I've got I've got no power, I've got the power shot off to the bench, but even if I use my, my my power supply here, I've got it set for about five volts, which should be more than uh, more than enough to move this motor. Nothing's happening. Right? Nothing's happening. 
no power being drawn like 100 milliamps but that motor should be turning it's not so either the motor itself is burnt out or it's seized up one of the two of course the really dumb design of something like this is without this motor to turn the volume up and down you can't turn the volume up and down there's no physical knob it's a linear control like a standard 250k dual pot that adjusts the volume just like any other conventional system and if I turn the the dial here you can see I can turn it up I can turn it down but of course this is internal you're not turning that when you're adjusting the volume it's all being done by this stupid motor and if the stupid motor doesn't work then you can't adjust the volume it's, it's a really stupid design as far as I'm concerned any it's one thing to have a motor turn uh, a, a linear control right that's pretty common but they all had a knob on the front that actually turned when you adjusted the volume up and down. And then if the motor failed, well, you can still control it manually, but not on this dumb design. On a dumb design like this, you're left with about one option. And that one option is to try and take the motor apart and see why the motor is not turning. Is it the winding is shot or is it just gummed up? So I'm going to try and take the back off of here and see if I can pull the actual uh, rotor out on this thing because this of course is sealed. I can't separate this from, it's, I think it's probably screwed in from this side here, from the gearbox, but uh, I don't know that I can get that apart. Um, possibly if I pull the control and everything off the board, I might be able to, but I'll see if I can get into the back of this first. If I can get into the back of the motor and get the motor freed up, then that might be a, a good alternative. Okay, yeah, I think I've got the tabs bent out of the way so I can actually pull the motor out here and see whether the motor is seized or what the problem is. No, it's not, doesn't appear to be seized there. Now why is it not turning? The, the contacts here don't appear to be in bad shape. Although it is kind of stiff. See if it'll turn if I apply power around the side of it here. Oh yes, it's trying to turn. That's a good sign. Maybe I can make this thing work. Okay, let's apply power and see whether this thing's gonna do anything while well, I've got it still kind of a half house apart. And don't see anything happening. unless the brushes aren't making a good connection because when I, you know, if you notice when I put the uh, when I put these alligator clips right up against the side of the motor it actually is going to start turning here, watch I put one on one side and one on the other it turns I'm just going to put a little bit of deoxit on the actual 
stator here. Clean it up a bit. Okay, you deoxid haters, you can thumb me down now, but this shit works, okay? This shit does it, and you'll see once I put this thing together that this bloody motor is going to work. We'll do the same on the contacts here. Make sure that they're clean. We'll try this one more time. Okay, after pissing around with this thing for about five times, getting this thing apart and putting it back together, I have movement. Ha <laughs> ha! I got movement on the motor. Okay, I just gotta squeeze this thing together so that they, it doesn't fall apart again. And maybe, just maybe, I'll be able to make this thing work. I'm holding a lot more hope out now than I was a little while ago. I'll tell you that much. Gotta get this motor squeezed back together. So it doesn't fall apart. Okay. <sighs> what happens when I hook this up to negative and positive? Will this thing turn? Boys and girls, I think I rebuilt the motor. I'm pretty impressed. The trick too, of course, putting these things back together is you have to hold the brushes out of the way. So I was able to wedge a small screwdriver in here, which was big enough that it would hold in the plastic and I could pry one over and lock it in place and then use my pick to move the, the, uh, the, the brushes out of the way so that I could center it over top of it. I mean, it's, I've been, it took me about five times to get this thing. You get, you got, you got the gist of when I was had it on camera. There, I had the camera off there for a while because I had this thing apart about five times. But uh, it, it's all a matter of just getting the. Uh, you have to get the brushes. You have to move them out of the way so that they can clear the armature. Otherwise, they're just gonna they're gonna get jammed up anyway. I got it. Now I can start putting this piece of crap back together. Easier said than done. I gotta open this thing up and uh, slip it over top of the motor. This is uh, magnetic shielding. I don't know why they have it in here. It's not like it's a tape deck or anything. But this is what this is. This is um, what they call mu metal. It blocks magnetism. And it goes on like that. As I say, probably not important, but. We'll keep it on there just to keep everything in place. We'll test this before I put it all back together too. Make sure it's make sure the wires are going the right way. They should be. I put the motor back the same direction that it came apart because it's keyed, right? So you can't really put it together wrong because well, it's not going to go together. Okay, I want to separate these boards so that they're not touching anything, and we'll turn on the power and 
see if this thing does anything. So power on, power on here, and better make sure that I don't want any sound here. So. Make sure it's turned all the way down. I don't want to be blasted out of the room here. Okay, power volume up. There we go. Volume goes up. Volume goes down. Uh, the light's burnt out. We'll uh, see if we can find a new bulb. Make sure I've got sound here. Yep. Two buttons together to turn it up. Okay, um, the light bulb here that goes in behind here is burned out, so see if I can source one or, or um, find an LED I can put in there. Okay, we'll attach our dropping resistor here. Yes, it is lighting up because capacitor inside is still charged. This goes into this condom, light condom, that will make it appear green as the original one was green. Just like that. The only downside with LEDs is it's going to glow for several seconds after the power is removed because, of course, the uh, they store power. They're much more efficient, so they don't run the power down. But anyway, uh, that's how it's going to look when it's in. We'll put this back together now and test everything out. I notice there's a couple of these other stupid lights are burned out on this thing too. Um, which ones are burned out on here? The bass and the treble, I believe, are, are burned out. I remember seeing that when I had it on. Uh, let's just check them out here. They're incandescent bulbs. But there's the power on to the unit. We should get some sound here. thing starts playing. Okay, these buttons here, which ones were working, which ones weren't. I control these three things. 
You gotta hold both buttons for it to go up and down, right? Because these ones make it go fast. This is fast. So turn on the fast light and others will. And then these are, that goes slow. Now it's slow up and slow down. Whatever that does. Um, okay, should be low boost. This is the high boost. Low and high boost. And high cut. That's the four preset tones. Looks like their little incandescent bulbs in here are not working. I thought I saw some of them lighting up before, but none of them appear to be lighting now. We measured a voltage across the back of these incandescent little bulbs. But I think they're probably about an eight volt bulb. Let's see here. I'll hit the treble cut. And that should be the bottom one, I think. See the bottom of the top. Seven volts, yeah. The thing that does need cleaning on this is this um, balance control. Clean that up. Yeah, I'm just gonna I'll, I'm gonna replace these incandescent bulbs with uh, some LEDs. I guess I think I've got some that'll that'll go in there. Uh, should be able to fit in. They don't have much in the way of leads on them though, because right? they're they're pulls from a uh, an old flashlight. So they've been soldered onto a board. So I don't know if I'm gonna have enough room with this um, with this rubber cap here to. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to have enough room to put them in. That's the only concern. So in the conversion to the LEDs on this, I'm just going to cut the trace for the positive side because you can see this is the positive lead here. And this feeds all of them in, all of them in parallel. So I'm just going to put one resistor across here. So I'm just going to cut that one first using sharp knives. Because, you know, a scalpel is pretty darn good for removing traces that's definitely open so now we'll just scrape some copper here on both sides And we'll drop in our resistor. And for you critics out there that say I'm using scissors, uh, these are not scissors, okay? And you can see here, Klein tools. These are actually electrician's snips. They cut exceptionally fine and um, these are what linesmen use all the time and fiber splicers and stuff use these things because the the cut quality of these, if I can get the camera in focus here, is amazing. There. Surgical steel, basically it's like having two scalpels going together and they cut exceptionally fine and they don't have any impact. They don't, they don't shock the wire when you cut it. That's why I use them. They're not scissors. They'll cut paper too, but they're not scissors. These are actually specifically designed for cutting wire and cutting fiber optic. Uh, they are expensive. Um, these little, this little pair of snips are, I think they run around thirty or forty dollars. So they're not, they're not cheap, right? But that's why I use them because you get a very good, accurate, clean cut. That's as good as anything else you're going to get. So that's that. Okay, let's uh, change these uh, 
stupid light bulbs. Let's see if I can break them taking them out. Because what I'm concerned about is the depth of these. Um, my wires aren't very long on the LEDs that are going in place of them. Let's uh, see how they look. Looks good. Okay, now I can put this thing back over top. I had to cut it off from below, but you know what? It'll fit nicely over top of that because the LEDs are a little bit bigger than the bulbs, so and never have to be changed again, so that, that should work out. Okay, let's get the board back in place. We'll start getting this thing back together, and we can move on to the next piece, because of course I've got two more pieces from this, uh, this system. I've still got the turntable, and I've got the cassette deck. But I got the whole, the whole system here to repair. There. That goes on like that. I've cleaned the balance control. I've cleaned the mic mixing control. And yes, I did clean that. I didn't show it, but trust me, I, I did clean it. You don't have to take my word for it. Okay, front panel. Back on, holding by whatever screws will hold it, I guess. As you can see, uh, one of the uh, brackets is completely gone and the other one is half gone. That long screw is going to cause me some headaches coming right up when I turn this thing on. Okay, power on. I'm gonna have my little unit boot up over here. Let's just check out the lights on this thing once we get sound. Okay, when I first put this thing together, I had a low sound on the right channel. What turned out to be was that the screw I put in here was too long. And it was shorting out the board. So, if you got one of these things, there's one screw that's shorter. And that goes in here. I didn't figure out why I put it. It worked fine when I had it apart. I put the front panel on. And my right channel was all distorted. And I took it apart. And then as soon as I took it apart, the thing worked. I was putting it back together again, and as I was putting the screws in, the right channel cut out. And I realized, wait a minute, one of these screws is slightly shorter than the other. So, be sure you put the right length screws in, because it can short the board. So here it is with the uh, lights on the front, bass up, bass, a treble up, bass and treble up, treble down. Our other lights 
aren't nearly so bright. And of course the volume control with its LED. Lights up quite nicely. If I press this button it says fast. As you can see, that's faster and slower for the speed of the volume. Slow. There you go. Doesn't sound bad at all. Let's get the top on this one and we'll do a final test. There you go, all done. Thanks for watching, we'll catch you in the next one real soon.